And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, to, to this uh, last AI ethics uh, seminar of the fall semester of 2021. We will uh, hope to get going with uh, further seminars in January. But today we have uh, Carl de Finelicht uh, speaking. Uh, he is uh, a senior lecturer in ethics and technology at uh, here at Chalmers and also a member of the Chair AI Ethics Committee. Uh, he will speak on artificial intelligence in public decision making on how transparency can and cannot be used to foster legitimacy. Carl, please go ahead. Right, thank you. Uh, I'll just start by sharing my screen here. Um, Ola, do you see it properly? I see yeah. it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, so hi, uh, thank you for coming today. So I'm going to talk about, as Ola said, artificial intelligence in public decision making, how transparency can and cannot be used to foster legitimacy. And this has to do with me being interested in in public decision making generally, uh, questions about legitimacy and transparency specifically, and AI. So uh, that is why I'm going to talk about this subject. And uh, the, right, let's see if I can, yeah. So today, uh, my thought was to begin with some conceptual issues. This was, will go uh, over rather quickly. Um, so don't worry if you find this uh, uh, less interesting, but I think it's good to begin uh, here. And then I'm going to say something about uh, the applications of AI today in public decision making. And I'm also going to say something about the upshots with uh, applying uh, these, forms, these sorts of technologies on uh, these sort of decisions. Uh, because I don't think that is always that clear. Um, so I, I'll say something more about that. And then I'll say something about the problems and how these problems are related to questions about legitimacy. And then I will say something about the possible solutions which has been proposed uh, and the solutions then which has to do with transparency. So uh, that is the roadmap for today. And um, if you have any questions or anything, I think it's easier if you take them afterwards, uh, then I would be happy to discuss. Um, it's hard to keep a look at the chat uh, while uh, talking. Otherwise, I'm sort of in favor of people interrupting me, but I think it's easier this way to just write up your questions and then take them after uh, the talk. Um, because it would be really interesting to hear what you have to say. So beginning with the conceptual issues, here is uh, Magdalena Andersson, our uh, prime minister. And legitimacy, what I'm going to call legitimacy here, is just the right to rule. So if uh, Magdalena uh, has a legitimate uh, government, say, uh, or a uh, if her party um, it has the right to rule in some sort of way, then it's legitimate. Perceived legitimacy is something else which is really important uh, when it comes to public decision-making. And that is just the perceived right to rule. So people have the sort of notion that Magdalena Andersson in this case actually has the right to rule. Now, of course, perceived legitimacy and legitimacy can come apart. So, People might think that uh, Magdalena Andersson uh, has no legitimacy at all, while she actually has, according to some set of criteria. Or it might be the other way around, that uh, she, people believe that she has the right to rule, while she actually has no such right. So these can come apart, and they are. Uh, in, it's interesting to uh, discuss them both. Uh, when I talk today about the empirical matters, those will have will um, uh, will be mostly concerned with perceived legitimacy, how people perceive uh, some sort of governmental agency or whatnot, uh, whether or not they have the right to rule. But oftentimes, uh, many people believe that perceived leg legitimacy is either sort of a part of the concept of legitimacy, so in, in 
in order for something to be legitimate, uh, we need to have some sort of group of people who believe that this is so, or uh, it's uh, sort of like a necessary condition for legitimacy in the sense that uh, it's impossible to rule anything without at least a certain amount of perceived legitimacy. Transparency then is just availability of information. So uh, information here should be, uh, should be interpreted as very widely. So it can be a lot of different senses of information. It can be people talking, uh, an algorithm or what have you. So it's the availability of information, transparency. And public decision-making, it's just has to do with the public in some way. So here I'm, uh, not, I'm not going, going, going to this any further. Uh, it's just uh, to say that, for instance, a private company can engage in public decision making because their decisions might uh, affect the public directly. So if a bank uh, denies someone a loan, uh, then that is uh, an instance of public decision making since it uh, affects the public in a direct fashion. Now, there are different views and different ideas about uh, legitimacy and uh, how it should be perceived. So, and this could be quite good to have in the background when you are talking about legitimacy of the right to rule. So we have pure proceduralism. Um, you don't need to <laughs> read uh, this text. I just cut it from another context. But uh, the basic idea here is with the procedural view is that for something to be legitimate, for a process to be legitimate, for government to be legitimate, uh, different sort of um, <clears throat> factors need to be in place in order for this to be so. So for instance, for Magdalene Andersson to be uh, a legitimate ruler, uh, she needs to have support from the people, for instance. She needs to be elected or what have you. And uh, these are outcome independent, so to speak. So it does not have anything to do with outcomes. It's just that the procedure needs to uh, be in a certain way in order for the government to be legitimate, for instance. And transparency here comes in uh, often as one of these factors or virtues or normatively normative expectations we should have on such a process. So for a process to be legitimate or produce legitimate results, it needs to be transparent in some way. So it does not have anything to do with outcomes. It's just has to do with procedures. Now, instrumentalism or some sort of outcome-based views, uh, they are instead interested in outcomes. So for Madeleine Anderson to be uh, legitimate or uh, to rule, uh, have a right to rule, uh, she needs to produce good outcomes in some way. Uh, then, of course, what a good outcome is can be debated, uh, but it could be uh, that if you just take some sort of classical uh, normative theory, such as uh, hedonistic utilitarianism, a consequentialist view, uh, then according to that view, uh, an action is right if it maximizes the total uh, sum of well-being. Then you could argue that uh, Magdalene Anderson has the right to rule if uh, her government produces the total, uh, ma maximizes the total uh, sum of well-being, for instance. Now, transparency in these kind of situations uh, often uh, tries to uh, work as an instrument where people think that it's instrumentally valuable or think that it's uh, necessary for producing uh, these sort of great outcomes. Um, so uh, for uh, the government uh, to produce good outcomes, for instance, or the best outcomes, whatever you want to uh, focus on here, the processes need to be transparent. People need to control the government, for instance. So it's not that uh, it's sort of like that there are some ideas here about that we need to have a process for its own sake, so to speak. Uh, it's instead it's focusing on the outcomes. And then we have a combination of, uh, many people combine these views, instrumentalism and proceduralism, and say that, okay, we need to have certain sort of uh, 
process features in place and the outcomes need to uh, look uh, in a certain way. Uh, and we have when we have this sort of combination of things, uh, we uh, have a, a legitimate rule. So that is that is basically the idea. Now, this is also when we talk about transparency, it could also be good to think about uh, that when this is just a, this definition here is just something people use in the uh, political science uh, research uh, community quite a lot. Uh, but uh, when you talk about transparency, it could be good to think about that we often have a wide range of different actors and a lot of different other, I mean, a lot of set of factors uh, which are supposed to um, <clears throat> Uh, take in the information which makes uh, which yeah, which makes uh, the I'm a bit sick so I guess I'm sort of blabbering I'm sorry but uh, the main thing here is that uh, when someone is making something more transparent uh, then that someone is making that something available to uh, the other actor. And of course, there are a lot of things that can be made available. And you can also think about whether or not or what it is to make something available to someone else. So all of these things are things which we need to have in mind, which makes the sort of discussion about transparency and AI in public decision making extremely complex. And uh, but uh, I don't think it's too complex to say something interesting about or uh, try to figure out what to do in different sort of contexts. Uh, it's just that it's a very complex notion and uh, or a very complex set of notions, I should say. Now, applications. So we have AI in our uh, public decision making processes. Uh, in a wide range of uh, areas. So in the court of law, I guess these are the most uh, widely discussed uh, AI applications. Uh, here we have the North Point Suite Case Manager. Uh, this, uh, this is a system which uh, allows you to do many things as judge, uh, but uh, one thing it's supposed to be helping you with is uh, that uh, it should help you with trying uh, to figure out whether or not someone will recede in crime. So uh, if it can actually help you with that, then it's really helpful when you're thinking about whether or not someone should go on parole or not. Um, we also have uh, a lot of uh, AI in um, <clears throat> when it comes to unemployment agencies. So uh, Vanya Carlson is going to come here uh, in March to talk about this, how the Swedish uh, Unemployment agencies are utilizing AI in their work. So it has to do with matching, but it also has to do with whether or not you are uh, applicable for different sort of uh, health uh, or different sort of benefits and so on and so forth. And they have quite a lot of power over uh, people since uh, if you're not, uh, I mean, do what they say, basically, you don't get your uh, unemployment uh, insurance. So it's very important here that it's working well for everyone. And of course, also banks. Banks is also one of these, uh, one of these topics where people have discussed quite a lot, whether or not uh, we should use algorithms in order to, for instance, decide whether or not one should get a loan or not. So there are a lot of different sort of areas where this is used. Now, why do we do this? Well, I mean, many of these uh, things are quite intuitive. Better use of scarce resources, less corruption. So if you talk to people from uh, countries where they have a lot of corruption, uh, this is seen as sort of a, a help to might get this, uh, might get that because then you can, in some cases you can uh, change a person to, against an algorithm. But in other, uh, other cases, you can curtail uh, what they do, basically. 
you also have a, a very high upshot with greater speeds. Uh, this is very important when it comes to social security benefits and stuff like that. People need money fast. So this is of great importance. And also, and perhaps more, most importantly, people hoped that we would get higher quality decision and actually increased fairness. And this has to do with a lot of different things. But uh, one thing is, uh, uh, is that uh, judges and other uh, public officials are both biased and they suffer from what some people call noise. So, uh, and that is, uh, people believe that that is quite unfair and then uh, they want to get rid of this uh, and we can use, or at least people think that we can use algorithms or AI to do this. Now, uh, one case, which is our case, but uh, one finding, which is very robust and uh, was reported in 70s, I think the first time, uh, is that uh, case judges, uh, judges who, uh, when they sort of decide whether or not someone uh, should go to prison or probation or not, they can, uh, in the same case where everything is exactly the same, either give uh, the person 10 years in prison or probation if they have leeway to do so. And in the American system, you have quite a lot of leeway. leeway. Um, so this is a very robust funded finding that uh, there are huge discrepancies uh, with regards to uh, the judgments uh, that judges hand out. And this is, of course, something which has been seen as a huge problem and something which has be, been discussed quite a lot. And this is not just in the court system, it's in the private and the public sector, it's everywhere. Where policy professionals, they have discre discretionary power, they can choose to do what they like within certain limits, but the limits are sort of like quite large, they have a large leeway. And in these sort of cases, we have these, uh, we have these very large discrepancies. And as I said, it's due to both bias and noise. So bias is just uh, uh, that uh, they sort of are systematically wrong with something. So perhaps you are uh, a bit racist. Uh, if you are racist, then you will judge uh, the one group who are you are racist against more harshly than other people, even though if uh, even though it's not anything different between the different cases, it's just skin color or what have you. Noise is just random stuff, <laughs> which uh, has no relevance to the case, uh, but still affects uh, your uh, sentencing. So it can be that your favorite uh, sports team loses. It can be that you have horrible weather. It can be that you haven't uh, eaten, and eaten for a few hours and you have low bl blood sugar. It cannot be anything. <laughs> All of these things have quite large impact on how harsh you are. So that is why, for instance, we as teachers should go through <laughs> our examinations a few times, <laughs> not just one time, uh, because we are exactly the same. Um, sometimes we have algorithms for ourselves, which we can use in order to uh, discern what grade uh, people should have. And then it's much easier to give the same result. Oh. Uh, because the solution here has been algorithms. Uh, so e already in the 70s, people talked about uh, using computers in order to uh, help uh, judges uh, do the sentencing. Um, but what they got instead was sort of like lists with check, uh, checklists and stuff like that, uh, which they had to follow. And then uh, the bias and the noise seemed to uh, become much less. But since the year 2000 in the American system, uh, this has been um, lifted. So now uh, judges can uh, freely set or almost freely uh, set uh, the <clears throat> punishment again. And uh, what, has been, what has been found is that both the bias and the noise has become much larger. Um, so solutions here are often algorithms. They don't need to be AI, but they could be AI in a lot of different sort of situations, or that is at least what people hope. 
then you would get sort of like more uh, intelligent uh, algorithms which can help you in the individual case, hope, uh, hopefully, instead of these more rigid uh, systems which you have today. And there are also a lot of empirical studies coming in now uh, where uh, people, especially mi minorities, find that or express that uh, they prefer uh, algorithm algorithmic decision making instead of human uh, decision making. So here is, for instance, an example uh, from a study uh, where they had two jets. So uh, uh, you see that there are two different pictures here, one with African-American police officers and one with uh, Caucasian uh, police officers. Uh, everything else is the same in both of these. And uh, when this was tested out, uh, so yeah, so the case was uh, that uh, they said in this uh, new uh, mock uh, mock um, article that uh, they need to do something about an intersection in an American city, and the intersection is uh, quite prone when it comes to accidents. So either we need to have a police officer in this intersection, or we can have a camera. And the police uh, don't mind; they they think that both solutions are equally good. And uh, <clears throat> so then they tested out what people think about this. Are people comfortable with uh, a camera uh, or are they more comfortable with uh, actual people standing there? And what they found was that uh, Caucasians or the majority uh, populations, the population in this kind, in this sense, uh, or in this case, uh, didn't mind. Uh, they didn't mind whether or not we had a camera or a police officer. Minorities, in this case, African-Americans, or people who say that they were African-Americans who self-identify as uh, African-Americans, they preferred uh, the camera before the police or a police officer. And uh, this was even more so when they had a picture of the Caucasian uh, police officers. In that case, they very much preferred <laughs> to have a camera instead of police officer, because they they thought that a uh, camera would be more fair, would uh, treat uh, them with respect in a much uh, hard, much larger uh, sense than uh, the police officers would. So there is also those kind of things to consider that people actually want algorithmic uh, decision making, at least when it comes to these sort of simple cases. When it comes to complex, ca complex cases, such as uh, uh, whether or not we should, or the social services should take uh, a, a child in foster care or something like that, then people are highly skeptical uh, towards uh, these kind of algorithms. But in these uh, kind of simple cases, uh, people seem to be, at least from the minority's point of view, uh, either that they don't care or that they are uh, very much in favor of using them. And at least sometimes when uh, we have uh, used uh, algorithms instead of people such as in Tredebori, uh, at least, uh, so this, is, this case is quite, uh, contested, so I shouldn't say that this is clearly uh, beneficial, but what has been found in uh, at least some of these cases is that uh, you get more time. Uh, so if you use an algorithm to decide whether or not someone should get a social security benefit or what have you, uh, if an algorithm does that instead of a person, you can take that person, that person can do something else. They can help people to get a job, which was uh, the case in this case, or they can do something else. They can uh, talk to uh, the people who have problems uh, and, and help them in different sort of ways. So that is, of course, another benefit from using algorithms. And they are really fast as well. Um, so this is up in the court now. I'm not sure uh, how it goes uh, there because there are different problems <laughs> with these kind of uh, algorithms and their use. So here is a critical uh, article about the Trello board case, the case where I said that I benefited from using algorithms. And uh, 
one uh, problem here they thought was that it's lack it's lack of transparency so uh, at least as i understand it they couldn't get a hold of the algorithm and analyze it so they couldn't get to the source code so to speak and also which is often i mean the case when you uh, use these sort of new technologies or a uh, new for i mean for this municipality is that uh, they had leaks with regards to sensitive information about people. So there are a lot of those kind of problems. And of course, uh, the thing that you wanted to use the algorithms for to make the bias less can also, uh, has also backfired. So, I mean, our algorithms have been quite biased as well. So whether or not they are more biased than people I mean, that is something uh, you need to examine, of course, but uh, this has been a huge problem. And this is something, I mean, most of you know that uh, has been worked on for quite a lot. So we have judges, they use the sort of uh, North Point suite or what have you. Um, another problem uh, with them using these uh, algorithms is that uh, one is that they have less leeway, less discretionary power. And this has been, so this could be good. As I said, it could make uh, the, the sort of random uh, effects on their decision less, and it can make um, their biases less pronounced in their decision making, which is really good. Uh, but uh, one upshot with having leeway is that you uh, can treat every, chi every case as unique, and uh, you can uh, give sort of like uh, the attention to each individual as he or she deserves. And that is something uh, which has been curtailed a lot by some of these algorithms, and it's been uh, seen as a large problem. Another thing is that uh, people have studied judges using the algorithms when the algorithms are more, uh, which they always are, as far as I know, uh, in the court system, when they are voluntary to use. And then what has been found is that, um, opposed to at least my intuitive understanding, is that uh, they became more biased in their decision making. And that is because when they get, uh, when the algorithm confirms their views, then they become much more certain that they are right. And that is often not good in these sort of very complex cases they are going to manage. So that makes them to become even harsher in their punishments, which in the turn is problematic in different sort of ways. But when the algorithm goes against them, that also enforces their view that they are right, <laughs> which is really strange, uh, perhaps uh, unintuitive to some extent, but uh, it's not that strange uh, if you have uh, read up on the social psychology on these sort of things. So oftentimes, uh, if someone is really sure about something and then they read a paper or what have you, arguing for that they are wrong, then they become even more certain. <laughs> and that has to do with a lot of different sort of uh, psychological mechanisms, but that is one problem uh, with uh, having uh, sort of like an opposing view forced on you uh, in these sort of situations. So uh, I should say that all of this, uh, all of this uh, research uh, need to be, I mean, so it's early days, even though people have done a lot of research on this, it's still early days. So we will see how this uh, will come out in the end. And I mean, there are a lot of things you can do in order to improve the situation for judges, for instance, to become uh, less biased in these sort of situations, but uh, it's still uh, quite uh, interesting and from what we know about human psychology, uh, quite uh, plausible that it's not, it will not be easy to integrate uh, these kind of uh, algorithms in decision making in order for to improve it in a very straightforward way. Right, so we had a name to produce something that is better than only human. And the result, according to a lot of people, is that it's worse than only human, are more biased, for instance, less transparent. 
and did affects uh, the legitimacy or and the perceived legitimacy uh, in in different sort of negative ways. People think that you don't have the right to rule uh, or less right to rule than you had before, and so on and so forth. I mean, those can be good, but uh, sometimes they're really bad, and uh, you can see the negative effects from them in uh, low trusting countries, for instance. And the solution has been transparency. And this is a general solution to all <laughs> public health, or not public health, but public uh, trust uh, and legitimacy issues uh, since the beginning of the 90s. But uh, we have seen this now in uh, the debate about AI as well. And first of all, it's we should always think about that it's the comparison that's interesting, right? So uh, a human mind is quite opaque. We, so a judge uh, is, could sort of like uh, deliberate and give a lot of reasons for the sentence he or she has given. Uh, but in the end of the day, we don't know if those reasons that judge gave are actually what sort of like caused the decision. Uh, because we don't know uh, that much about the mind. What we know is that uh, there are a lot of different sort of stuff which affects us, uh, which we don't know anything about. Uh, I mean, even I, standing here talking, I don't know um, uh, why I talk as I do, or, and so on and so forth. Uh, so a lot of things are just uh, rationalizations afterwards, and it's really hard to discern what's what. So the human mind uh, is, to some extent at least, a black box. So it's not as black, perhaps, as an algorithm, because we know certain things about, for instance, how education affects people, how their values affect their decisions, and so on and so forth. And then we can control them in different sort of ways, at least we think, by uh, uh, perhaps holding them accountable and what have you. But still, it's what we need to think about is that the comparison here is key and we don't know that much about the mind, especially not in individual cases, in order to say uh, whether or not a decision was sort of uh, <clears throat> come out because the person was prejudiced or a person had actually good reasons or have you. That's really hard to say. And we saw, I mean, before that a lot of uh, decisions can be, uh, or there's a lot of bias and noise in uh, our decision, public decision making today. But with this being said, possible solutions, how can transparency and AI foster legitimacy? Now, here we have the public. This is how uh, political scientists, scientists and policymakers often think about how we can uh, make uh, AI more legitimate. So here's the public. We can make the AI available for everyone, for the public. That is one very simple thing from a policymaker perspective, because if this would uh, help us or help them, uh, then th this is actually something they could do. We could have the public watch when it's produced. They can sort of like sit on the sidelines of the assembly line. Uh, when the programmers and others, uh, politicians sets the goals, for instance, the programmers tries to tease out how to uh, take these goals and make something uh, more, <clears throat> more practical and uh, operationalizing them some way and trying to come up with uh, how to deal with all of these sort of problems of bias and what have you. Um, so that is another thing you can do. And of course, you can have this, you can open up the black box if that is possible. Uh, and then you could uh, get answers to uh, our how and why questions. So how is often uh, connected to interpretability. Uh, so how did something happen? It's sort of like an explanation for something. And why, why did this happen to me? So uh, why did you come up with these decisions? And then someone justifies uh, their views towards you. At the bank, they might say that you have, a, have too low of a salary or too, um, 
little uh, in your bank account in order to get the loan or what have you, because we have seen that people have that are that low on salary and low on bank account uh, or means, the means or resources, what have you, um, they will often fail uh, when trying to pay back. So you need to push up to this and this level. Uh, while the how is more for programmers, how to, how to, I mean, very, I mean, how to look into the algorithm, so to speak, and follow it uh, in its uh, tracks. Right, so transparency. So when we talk about transparency, it's important to talk about the transparency of what? So the first thing when you either, or the first two things I should say, when you either uh, give someone access to the algorithm or, I mean, the source code, and uh, if you let them into the sort of process when it's produced, uh, that is uh, what's often called decision. Uh, transparency in process, which is the decision making process. So then we have the decisions. You can make those transparent, and you often do. Uh, here you could say, uh, uh, of course, that during uh, the production of an algorithm, from sort of like uh, coming up with the goals and so on and so forth to implementing it, I mean, we have to take a lot of different sort of decisions on the way. And many of those decisions are not made transparent, which has been uh, topic of debate in recent years. And then we have the explanations and justification, which is sometimes called transparency and rationale. And we also have another thing which we could make transparent and we could more make use of in this sort of discussion, which I don't think uh, is as uh, much debated yet. And it has to do with the post-decision work where you evaluate support people and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> here I think actually is the source to uh, much of those perceived legitimacy issues at least when it comes to algorithmic decision making. So you could think about a decision mm -hmm. as, um, so say that you go to a bank and you get no on the loan. Uh, what a post-decision work would be is to help the person to understand what they should do in order to get the loan next time. Or perhaps uh, uh, if you are, uh, if you ask them what they want the loan for, uh, of course you do that. Uh, but then if it's for an apartment say, then you can help them find another apartment which is uh, more in their price range or something like that. And uh, if you do that, then even these sort of opaque black boxes will be much more um, I think uh, much more uh, accepted, widely accepted by people. So it might not be that we need to focus that much on the algorithm as such as we need to focus on what lies around and after the algorithm, so to speak. Now, we had these aims, results, the solution was transparency, and we had the black box, made people skeptical toward AI. And now there are a lot of cases where, where we at least can imagine. It's not that today, actually. Uh, the AI used or the algorithms used and uh, the courts are often quite poor. Um, but just assume that we have an algorithm which uh, has a much higher accuracy rate than a human being in the sense that, for instance, it's much better to predict whether or not someone will recede in crime. In those kind of situations, uh, it might be that we want to use the algorithm, uh, but people and judge judges will might at least uh, during, at some point in time be um, against it. And then we can then we can look into the policy tools, which we talked about just now, the the process and the explanation and the explanations and see whether or not they can work in this sort of case. So if we take the process, these two have been discussed the most in social science literature in recent years, or the recent year, um, is accessibility to the algorithm and accessibility to the production of the algorithm. So here is something which is often tried out. 
uh, which has to do with, okay, um, and this is something people who are into legitimacy, which is of the procedural kind, are often uh, quite interested in and think is extremely important. So if we have the public and experts and they have accessibility to the source code, this should, according to these people, uh, lead to that the public, when they see this, that they become more trusting of the algorithm. And they think that it's more legitimate than before. And also that, um, that this actually also fosters legitimacy properly. Now, when it comes to perceived literacy, if they just come to know, people just come to know that experts and they themselves and others have uh, accessibility to the algorithm, this has at least what people have uh, found uh, at recently, um, no effect or very marginal effect on perceived legitimacy. So when you test out these sort of then jets where you say uh, an algorithm takes decisions about, for instance, visa applications, and uh, they say that, oh, uh, by the way, experts and the public have full access to the algorithm and they provide a link or something. Uh, that could be a one win, that's one win jet in one experiment, actually. And the other win jet says that experts and the public have no access to the algorithm. In those two kind of cases, people don't seem to mind. They don't care. They don't care whether or not people have access or experts have access to the algorithm. Um, so it seems to be that that sort of uh, policy tool does not seem to be work, working really well when it comes to algorithms. And that has been tested on very different sort of cases. So these applications is one, but they have tested on much more complicated cases as well. Now, of course, it could be that uh, the quality of the algorithm uh, could be improved by having people auditing uh, the algorithm. And that can, I mean, in that case, can indirectly lead to higher effects on perceived legitimacy since people might think that, uh, uh, people think that, I mean, it's a well-known effect that if people uh, get something which they think is better, um, in this case, uh, uh, faster and uh, better, uh, not faster perhaps, but higher, more decisions of higher quality that perhaps are more accurate or what have you, then they might perceive that this is more legitimate, this algorithm, than if it wasn't. Uh, but then they need to sort of like see that this is actually so that this quality is actually better and so on and so forth. So it's, yeah, so it's quite hard. Actual legitimacy, well, it depends on what we believe about legitimacy, but uh, having access to this could lead to, I mean, bad effects as well, or at least some people argue uh, that it's easier for people to game the system and so on and so forth. So it depends very much on both the effects, but also if you are uh, into this sort of procedural thinking, thinking that uh, what we need is uh, for something to be legitimate, for someone to have the right to rule, that we have a process of a certain kind, and uh, this thing is what needs to be transparent in order to uh, have this form of legitimacy, then of course. But I think that There is something to it, but I'm not sure to what extent that uh, fits the bill, so to speak. Now, accessibility to production of the algorithm, um, it's another story and it's quite complicated, but um, the idea here is that, and this is something which is quite common to do today in other forms of pol in political decision-making is that you give access to everything which has to do with the production of a policy, for instance. So you could have uh, a system where you track people's coding, uh, where you 
uh, allow people to uh, uh, be uh, to be at meetings where the politicians and others are taking a lot of decisions about what we should do and so on and so forth with the algorithm, what sort of accuracy rates it should have over different star populations and what have you, uh, and be in the programmers' meetings uh, to see what they say about this, how they are trying to optionalize everything. And we can have all of these sort of surveillance things and make sort of open up the process. This is full transparency, right? Um, and the public will be there, of course. Now, there are a lot of problems with this. I'm just uh, setting it out here. You can, I have written a paper about this from 2020, uh, where we try to tease out a lot of different problems with the full transparency in the process idea. But I can just say one limited thing. And uh, yeah, actual uh, legitimacy is also a, a thing, but I, I, I was just thinking that I could say a limited, very small thing. And it is that it's very hard to at least create perceived literacy by uh, letting people in. And this can be seen, for instance, when uh, people are presented with performance metrics of different sort of algorithms, in, which, is, which are used in public decision-making, uh, even if they are really great, much better than people, and they are presented as such, people still lose trust in the algorithms. Uh, so when they uh, come to understand that they're not perfect, uh, they become less trusting towards them and find them less legitimate uh, or less, yeah, less usable, so to speak, when it comes to legitimacy in public decision making. So, uh, so it's still, I think, quite good to have it. Uh, quite, this is something you need uh, in order for uh, create something which is more, which is legitimate. And uh, to create a legitimate, legitimate process, you need to be open with these kind of things. But then again, uh, we might have a tension here between people perceiving that a procedure is legitimate, legitimate and it actually being so. So it's really good to be very clear about that. Now, just finishing off here with explainability. This was the only pick I found which was free on a neural, <laughs> deep neural network. Um, this is the, actually the key if you want to produce high perceived legitimacy. Uh, because people just knowing that we can get an explanation for uh, why the algorithm did what they did in form of a justification, say, you did not get the loan because this is this, this actually increases uh, perceived legitimacy among the people. And this is also demanded from most uh, ideas or theories about legitimacy. Um, so this is the most powerful and it's, I mean, it's very hard to produce as you all know, but uh, this is the one thing to actually uh, to uh, go for. But we should think about that this is tendency on a population level. So um, when you test this out, uh, different sort of explanation works differently well on different sort of populations. So minority uh, people, for instance, want to, uh, or they get no, they think that it's, they don't like these sort of tailored, uh, explanations, which are sort of more subjective in nature. Uh, they like the very objective explanations in terms of numbers and so on and so forth, while a majority populations like the human touch, so to speak. So exactly how this should be uh, decided and devised is another matter. And that's one big problem, except for technically <laughs> creating or producing explainable AI is that uh, it needs to do a lot of different things. One algorithm needs to come up with different sort of explanations. Um, so, I mean, one for people who are interested in programming, another for policymakers, another for the public, probably, probably. So they all need to have different sort of explanations in order to buy into 
this kind of algorithmic uh, uh, decision making, uh, the algorithmic decision making. So we won't find any universally applicable explanations. We will need to sort of think about uh, exactly who uh, is the target for the explanation and then try to tailor it to them. So transparency in process might be positive, but it might uh, have negative effects on the quality of the system. I didn't say much about that, but uh, there are a lot of different sort of quality issues when it comes to that. Um, and then we can get indirect positive negative effects on perceived legitimacy depending on how uh, it works out in them. And <clears throat> yeah, and it might have uh, negative or no direct effects on perceived legitimacy as well. Uh, but transparency and rationale to give explanations, uh, that seems to be uh, giving a very positive direct effect, can have also uh, positive indirect effects on um, perceived legitimacy because it might help to increase the quality uh, in the decisions and decision making process. So explana explainability here is the key, so to speak. Thank you for listening. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much, time. Carl. Thanks. Um, we have some time for questions and comments, and we already have a bunch of uh questions uh in the chat i oh. think um, moa was first Moa, do you want to ask your question no response uh, the question is here in the chat. You mentioned access to source code, but what about access to data sets in the case of neural networks? There is more on the mm. microphone. Yeah, sorry, I just had some issues here with uh, Zoom and two screens and <laughs> uh, again. Uh, yes, but uh, you mentioned um, a lot of auditing the algorithms and, and the source code and so on. Uh, I, I guess I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, auditing the actual data sets from which these algorithms are trained, if we're talking about AI algorithms. Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't say that. Um, that is often uh, thought about as part of uh, the transparency and process thing. So uh, in the process of producing uh, the algorithm, which then helps us take the decision. Uh, we use data in order to train the algorithm uh, and test it out. And so if we see transparency as partial and not full, so we just make, for instance, that sort of uh, the data, as you say, transparent, that might help, I think, in order uh, for others to audit the data for biases and stuff like that and uh, give, um, constructive suggestions on where to get new data in order to get a fuller picture of uh, what you're trying uh, to do. So I think that is one of the most um, promising things if you want to produce this sort of uh, some sort of legitimate process since uh, then we can actually raise the quality um, in what the uh, algorithm is uh, doing or the quality of the algorithm. and uh, people, if people see that and come to understand that, they might appreciate that. And then we might get greater acceptance for um, using the algorithms in the end. And of course, I mean, algorithms is also something we can use. So if we take data sets and also accuracy rates, uh, we could, at least in theory, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we can do it in practice, but. Uh, we could tweak it such that um, it become less biased towards minorities than uh, normal judges are. And then we can be upfront with that, for instance. Um, we can even have them more, yeah. So that that's, yeah. So, but the data sets is a really good point. I think that is a very constructive way of being transparent without, uh, for instance, have these sort of uh, risks we have with people gaining the system and so on and so forth. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next question is for, from uh, Jack. Yeah, hi, Carl. Thank you very yeah. much for your uh, presentation. Um, I, uh, I was wondering if the concept of transparency paradox, which comes from the world of privacy, which is coined by Helen Nissenbaum, is all about uh, is that would be appropriate to your uh, line of research in terms of uh, because when we make something fully transparent if that's let's say theoretically possible people kind of get overwhelmed and you already alluded to that but is it also then that we also still need the experts or algorithms to uh, increase the trust in, in 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 the whole process so do we need experts uh, and algorithms in order to make sure that we uh, keep trusting algorithms <laughs> Yeah, um, I was uh, I was in a at a conference two years ago now presented uh, some of these ideas and uh, <clears throat> the computer scientists there thought that the best thing would be if you just want to produce perceived legitimacy is to uh, train uh, the algorithms, uh, train one set of algorithms to come to understand what people uh, react positively to. And then they could they could sort of like be used separately <laughs> from the actual ad algorithms who are making the decisions, and then the other I mean produce uh, explanations which are not at all have, have does not have anything to do at all with what actually goes on in the decision making process. But no, no, that's uh, that's a great idea. So, uh, that's a great point. So uh, the transparency paradox uh, is something which I think. Uh, is actually speaks against uh, full transparency. And it's often in social science, it's often called information overload, um, uh, where you sort of like get over, you just get, as you said, uh, get so much information, you don't know what to do with it. And one, I mean, so one uh, suggestion I had in one paper was to uh, try to, from the government's point, or I mean, from or from someone uh, to produce algorithms which package uh, all that information uh, and uh, can help us to retrieve uh, more information when we want to, and then tailor sort of like uh, tailor uh, all that information to our needs somehow. So I think that could be uh, that could be a way uh, to work with this. So then if the government is fully transparent with, for instance, the algorithms they use in uh, the unemployment agency, uh, if we have algorithms on our hand, we have apps or what have you, and we are interested in these sort of questions, they could go into uh, all of that data, tailor um, that data uh, so that it fits our needs, that we can understand it properly, and then that we can do more in-depth research with uh, this uh, app or algorithm and then um, that might lead to something good uh, because then we could also perhaps um, be helpful in auditing uh, these sort of algorithms uh, in different sort of ways so uh, so it could be good quality wise but it could also give us actually uh, something more than just a lot of information we don't know what to do with we are almost out of time but if we can be brief, we have time for a question from Alexander. Hi, Carl. Um, so this touches briefly on what you, the, the, the previous question. So I'm interested in if you can ab elaborate quickly on what it is, why different groups want different explanations, what it is about explanations that, that make them useful or relevant for different uh, groups of people. Yeah, so it's a good, question so there, there are i mean so so just uh, as it is with perceived legitimacy and actual legitimacy um there are two sort of uh, uh, things going on here so what has been seen is that local simple uh, explanations works uh, or people find those really uh, that they work well for them uh, uh i mean on the population level, people are no experts in the subjects or what have you. So they don't want, if they get more fully, uh, full explanations and also global explanations, so uh, they get to know more than uh, about, they get to know, know more than about their individual case, then they uh, trust or uh, feel that they are less legitimate 
uh, those algorithms uh, than with a smaller explanation, so to speak. So um, if we want to uh, raise people's uh, sort of perceived legitimacy in uh, AI uh, decision-making processes, we should give them simple and uh, local explanations. Uh, but uh, the same is not true for expert or policymakers. They want complex, they, they want a fuller explanation. Otherwise, they won't uh, agree with it at all. So, um, so I guess that uh, you could say that, uh, I mean, depending on uh, what your interests are, basically, you will uh, have different sort of views and perceive the explanations in different sort of ways. But it could be interesting to, I mean, to think more about what sort of explanations people should get and not just what they want to get or are positively affected by. Thank you. Um, Great question. Um, let's take one more final question. Maria is in line. Your mic. Quickly then. Yes, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Carl. It was really interesting. Uh, on your slide uh, with um, on transparency, you kind of had transparency of the decision process and transparency of the decision and then transparency of the rationale mm. as separate things. What is transparency of the decision beyond transparency of the process and transparency of the rationale? Right, it's a great question. So, um... <clears throat> So you and I can have a discussion about uh, what to do in a research project, say. Uh, uh, and then, so that, that is the um, transparency and process. If someone monitors us, <laughs> they would get the process. And then we have to decide on something. And uh, then we perhaps decide that we'll go for A rather than B. Uh, so the decision is A. And then uh, when we go to our funder uh, after we have uh, <laughs> come up with this decision, uh, we'll tell them, uh, we'll give them a lot of reasons for uh, the decision A instead of B or just A. And that would be uh, the rationale uh, thing. And uh, so traditionally, uh, what has only been uh, sort of the focal point before the 90s in political science and uh, in most social science was making the decision transparent. So what came before and after was beside the point. Uh, so uh, decisions was the most important thing. Uh, procedures. So, so in yeah. this case, it would be that the decision is A and that would suffice as yeah. a decision being transparent. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> thanks. All right, there are still pending questions, but, but uh, we are over time and, and we should stop. So I propose that we Thank Carl for uh, for his talk and for discussion and for to everyone else who contributed to the discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. This uh, officially ends the seminar.